I would like to start with a question today. Have you ever had to deal with a seemingly impossible situation? Have you ever had to deal with a seemingly impossible situation? As I was preparing for this day, uh, the sermon, an old memory came to mind, and I, 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 I think this is what I'm supposed to share, because I, it's an impossible situation in my life. That causes Julie great fear. She doesn't know what I'm going to say now. I remember coming back from vacation with our, in our, with our children. We had a, at that time, we had a full-size van. We had four small children. Our oldest was probably eight. Our youngest was probably two or three. And we were coming back. It had been a great week, but we were tired. It was Saturday morning early. We were somewhere mid-south, maybe north Georgia. I can't remember exactly. And we'd gotten up early because I wanted to drive home and get ready for church the next day. And I still remember getting everybody in the van, and we got gas, and we were going through the city on a highway. And all of a sudden, the car starts coughing. You know what I mean? You know that sound. And, all, and, and so I pulled off, and, and then all of a sudden it just dies. I mean, it's, it's dead. And now, it isn't because there's not gas. I filled up the tank. But, I mean, it was really dead. And I'm sitting there going, it's Saturday morning. We're not in a big city, but it's, not a, it's a medium-sized city. I said, I, are we going to be stuck here? What am I going to do? There's really, I, I, ah. And this is pre-cell phones. Does anybody remember that? So I'm looking out the window and trying to figure out what to do. And I looked down. I could see down the road. I saw something called a phone booth. Anybody remember those? And I thought, well, let me go down there and try it. And so I walked a uh, ways down there and got there. And I thought, I hope there's a phone book in it. Because most of the phone books, you know, have been gone by that time. Or, you know, but I got there and this, this, this phone booth had a phone book. And I opened up the, something called the Yellow Pages. It's like Google. And I remember looking at you know, auto repair. I started calling people and nobody was answering until finally I got one guy, he says, you know, I could help you this morning. I'm in the shop. And I explained that I can't drive there. He said, you know, we have a, uh, not a tow truck, but we have a truck that can take larger cars. And I'll come pick you up. So he did, and he got there. And so he, you know, brought the truck, and they pulled it up on top and then took it to this place. It wasn't very far, probably, you know, 10, 15 minutes away to a shop. Um, the shop was kind of like on a road like 135, and and he said, I'm going to need two or three hours to find out what in the world's going on. Okay, we have three, we have, no, we had four children, didn't we? Four little kids at this point, like, what are we going to do with them? And I look across the street, and there's a, um, uh, there were some stores, and it was about 10 o'clock by this time. And, and I said, why don't we just go over there? And, and we start looking over there, and it was a, the store that we saw uh, was a J.C. Penney's um, outlet store, which I didn't know J.C. Penney had outlet stores, but they did. Anyway, so we walked across this road and, and got in there, and we, it was getting close to school starting, so um, we thought get the kids some stuff that they needed. But what was really interesting as we got in there, now, to tell this part of the story, and I, all I can do is tell you, um, my wife is very tall. I always said I wouldn't marry any woman unless I could look up to her, and the Lord took me seriously. So... When you're over six foot and a woman, you, don't, you can't find clothes. I didn't know this until I got married. They don't, they don't believe women really are taller than 5'10 or 5'11. And I never understood how difficult it was for women to find clothes if you don't fall into certain categories. And we got in there, and we're in this JCPenney outlet, and, and we were walking through the women's section to get to the kids' section. And all of a sudden, I, 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 I think one of us just started looking they had a whole t tall women's section there. And it was the first time I've ever seen clothes that Julie could wear in a store. And she got in there, and she was very happy. And um, we did get the kids some stuff, and Julie walked out with several outfits that could inter interchange. It was a real, and she needed the clothes, so it was a really good thing. So we're walking back to the car, or the van at that point, with lots of bags. And we get back, and the guy goes, you know what, I was able to fix it. And 
and I'll have you on your way in just a few minutes. And so we got in there, and, and it, it actually worked that way. We actually got in the car. I got the kids situated with a, a movie with a VHS. Remember those things? We put them in. And we started traveling. You have to understand, one of my greatest fears was being broken down on the side of the road with young children. To me, that's an impossible situation to deal with. Particularly when I don't know, in a foreign town, I don't know anything. We don't have cell phones, and I don't know what's open. But we did make it home. And I want to stop there. I want to finish the story in just a little bit. That's a seemingly impossible situation. At least it was to me. I want to go to our text today, which is four vignettes, if you will. Four stories of truly impossible situations. I mean, these are seriously impossible. And yet they're all intertwined. This is one day. This is one very short span of time. I, I really can't break any of this up. You need to look at the whole flow of this to understand what's going on here. And why, why Matthew put this right here in this passage? We've been working our way through Matthew. Remember, the point of Matthew is that Matthew's teaching us that Jesus is the king. He's revealing that he's the promised king, the one who's coming, the one who fulfills all the Old Testament, the one that we've all been waiting for. He talks about in 5 through 7, chapters 5 through 7, we heard him, the king who, who can preach and teach and bring wisdom, the very wisdom of God for us. We saw miracles and, and all kinds of things happening, healings through you know, chapters 8. In the fir- and then as we start now, I want to go to chapter 9, verse 18. And with this thought, let's prepare our hearts for this. Father, help us to understand, to see what's in your word. And may we dare believe that your word will speak to us this morning as you speak through it. Jesus is truly in your name we pray. Amen. Verse 18 starts when he was saying this. Now let me, let me pause here. This is Jesus talking. This is last week. Last week Jesus was talking to John's disciples. They had come to him and saying, you don't fast the Pharisees like, the, like, like we do and like the Pharisees do. What's going on? And Jesus responding, responded by saying, I didn't come to repair Judaism. I didn't come to put a patch on it. I'm new wine, and I'm, my new wine has to go in new wineskins. I'm doing something different, a new act. Now, while he's saying that, the events of this, this day, are all going to happen. It's right, it's all, it's all jammed right next to next. So here we go. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader, actually he's the chief of the synagogue, there are parallel passages. Parallel passages means there's the same story and a bit more of the story in, in Mark and in Luke. And both Mark and Luke give more of the story. Uh, and, and you can, a parallel passage is where you read it from like three different points of view. We know, for example, from Luke, the synagogue leader's name was Jairus. But a synagogue leader came and and knelt before him. Now, actually, what it says is, in the midst of this crowd, there's this huge crowd around Jesus. He just told all this. He just did all this stuff. And the crowds, it's, it's, it's just jammed. In the midst of this, the synagogue ruler who's the head of the the head of the synagogue in Capernaum, where, where they're at. He, he comes and kneels before him. Literally, it says bows down. It's a worship term. He falls down before him to worship Jesus. In a time when Pharisees and, and Jesus were beginning to get loggerheads, it's an incredible thing that he did this publicly. Publicly, he falls down before Jesus. And he says, my daughter has just died. Now think about it. What would drive a man from his daughter's bedside? Either she's dead or just about dead. What would drive him from her side? But he left. He ran to find Jesus. He says, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. You need to know something, and this is painful for me, but I need to say it. In this culture, while Jews valued children, they valued boys particularly. Girls were not particularly valued. And 
there will be some people who would say, don't bother the teacher with that. It's just a girl. And there's still places in our world where girls are not valued. I know that's true. You need to watch this. Four impossible situations. The first one is a father whose daughter has just died. His only daughter. Going on. Jesus gets up. He hears him. In the midst of the crowd, he hears. He, and he, he just gets up and he goes. But notice something. His disciples go with him. We get to go where Jesus goes, guys. Now, meanwhile, let's go on to 20. On the way to his house, the second vignette begins. Vignette begins. We have a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. I need to talk about this. A woman who is bleeding for 12 years means for 12 years she has been unclean. She hasn't been able to go to worship for 12 years because she's been bleeding. Any chair she sits on, any bed she lays on would be considered to be unclean and have to be ceremonially cleaned. Anyone she touches would be unclean. I want you to sense of what she must have endured all this time. We learn over in Luke that she had spent all of her money on doctors and, and doing everything she can to get well, but she, nothing was working. It was an impossible situation. She couldn't do anything about it. She was out of it. There's nothing else that could be done. And then she hears about Jesus. What kind of courage would it take for a woman that she knows any Anybody I touch, any good Jew I touch, I make them unclean. What would drive her to go into a crowd of people to touch Jesus? Do you ever think about that? This woman had courage, real courage. And she goes through and she comes up behind him. She didn't want to come up in front of him. She didn't want to, she didn't want to be embarrassed by him saying, no, don't touch me. You'll make me unclean. Don't, don't come near me. I, I, you know... As a woman in this time, she was, I mean, her word wasn't even, was not even good at, in, in a legal case. She's not worth it. And Jesus goes, I love this. I mean, if you look at the pictures of this, what artists have done over the years, you usually find her crawling up to the crowd to touch the edge of his garment, hoping not to be seen, hoping not to be. No, I don't want anyone to know I'm here. But look what happens. And I want you to read the Luke passage to find out more. But she said her to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. But you need to know something. The tense of if only, if I only touch, is, is, it's in the tense that goes, it's repeated, it's, it's constantly repeated. She's saying this to herself over and over. If I only touch his cloak, I'll be healed. If I only touch his cloak, I'll be healed. If I, I got to get through this. If I only touch his cloak, I'll be healed. And she works her way through, and, and she puts her hand, and she touches, and we learn this from Luke, every, every, every adult Jewish male on their robe had four tassels that we can go into this, but basically remind them of who they are, that they're a Jew, that they're, God, they're God's chosen people. She touched, the lowest thing she could grab was that tassel, and she touched it. Was her faith perfect? No. Is this superstition that, where Jesus is closed, healing closed? No. But Jesus knew something happened, and somebody had touched her. Now go on to the next slide in 22. Jesus turned and saw her. Well, you can read the rest of the story in Luke and in Mark, but what's important here, he says, take heart, be courageous. But look what he calls her, daughter. It's the only time Jesus uses this phrase with someone. Here's a woman that's been put out. She's excluded. She's, she's not part of the family anymore. And now look what he calls her, take heart, daughter. Not only is she going to be healed physically, she is healed emotionally, relationally, spiritually, every aspect of her life. She knows who she is now. I, I, I'm restored to who I should be and more than I used to be. I love this. Take heart, 
daughter. Without a word said to him, he knows who she is. And he knows her deepest need. And he addresses it right there. He says, your faith has healed you. Her courage. What, did, what was her faith at this point? She just simply came to Jesus. She wouldn't let anything stop her. She's just got to come to Jesus somehow. She doesn't even know what Jesus will do, but she's got to come there. She has no other options. The situation was impossible. It was, she was desperate. All I can do is come to Jesus, and that's what she did. And the woman was healed at that moment. See, was Jesus unclean by touch? No. She was touched. He was touched by a clean woman. It's kind of fun. I love this. This is a cool one. Now, meanwhile, this goes on. Let's go on to the next part of the story. She, so the crowd all hears us. Now, the one part I need you to make sure you saw, Jairus, the synagogue rover, is bouncing up and down going, Come on, Jesus, my daughter. Come on. Can't you just feel the tension in the air? Don't stop. Please don't stop. Don't talk to her. She's a woman. She's a nice woman, but don't. No. Come on, Jesus. Paul, come, come on. I can, I can put myself in his shoes. I would have been dying at this point myself. Pulling him along. Come on, Jesus. We've got to go. Go, go. And the crowd's going crazy. Here's another healing. A woman who's been, you know, whoa. And by the way, do you realize he publicly healed her so that everybody in the crowd would know if they knew this woman, she is not unclean anymore. She was clean. She's whole. She's a daughter of Abraham. She is a daughter. His child. You know, I want you to make sure you saw that. Okay, now Jesus enters the synagogue leader's house and saw the crowd and people <clears throat> playing instruments. Now, you need to know when someone dies at, in, at this time, in the, in the Jewish tradition, you would bury them that day or as soon as you can. They didn't have ways to embalm, and so you would, you would literally bury them within hours. And soon as someone dies, um, if you had the resources, the money, you would bring in professional mourners, women who wail, and all kinds of instruments, because it was a sign of how much you love that person. We do the same thing today. We do. We do flowers. We do all kinds of stuff. But imagine, he left a house quiet, Jairus did. He comes into the house, you could hear the wailing down, I mean, weak, I mean, down the street, you'd hear wailing. You hear the instruments, and as he walks in, it's full of people, and there's wailing, because of, because of his position and his wealth, wailing was going on, and the instruments were playing, and everybody's in there, people have brought food. You just did that. You cared for each other. And going on the next verse for me, because he's, Jesus says at this point, he says to everybody, go away, the girl is not dead but asleep. I want you to note something here. They all laughed at Jesus. They know what death looks like. They deal with it every day. They, they know, this, these are not foolish people. They know when people are dead. Okay, I need to be very clear about that. Moving on then to 25. At this point, something happens which also then shows the, the real courage of Jairus. He clears house. The crowd has to be put outside. All the mourners are put outside. All the musicians are put outside. All the friends are put outside. And if you read the Luke and Mark passage, you can see what that looked like. But I want to, Jesus goes in and takes the girl by the hand, and she got up. Now, the same crowd that's been following Jesus is a part of all this, okay? This is all been talking about. Everybody's hearing about it. And news of this spread through all the region. Yeah. Now look what just happened right after this. As Jesus went on from there, leaving that house, going to where he was going to stay, two blind men have been following him. Now if you're blind at this time, you are considered to be sinners. Either you sinned or somebody or your family sinned. Something happened. You're not right with God. Because see, you're right with God if you're blessed, healthy, <laughs> and frankly, male. Okay? 
And these two blind men who have been overlooked and stepped around, they've been begging, they, they've been following, listening to all this. They listened to a, a woman who was healed, a, a girl brought back from the dead, and they're following Jesus, and they're, they're listening, they're following because they hear the crowd talking, and, they, and they're still with him. And they call, they're calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, notice something about these words. Do you realize this is language that speaks to who Jesus is as the king? He is David's son, David, David's promised son. And what he's saying, what they're appealing to is the king's mercy. Saying the king has the power to do whatever, he has the power. It's his mercy we're appealing to. Have mercy on us, son of David. Now look what he, Jesus says to them in 28. When Jesus had gone indoors, he didn't respond right then to them. When he had gone indoors, the, the blind men wouldn't give up. They come to the door of, of the house where he's at. And he asks them, Jesus now asks them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And I can hear them thinking, in, we know you just healed a lady who was, who was bleeding. We know you just had a, a girl, you, you caused her to come back to life from the dead. Yeah, you, can, you could do this. You could help us see. And they say, yes, Lord. They don't have great faith. They have a little bitty faith. Because they've seen a great God act. Now going on with this in 29. Now I want you to see this. You may not see it in the same way. We read over these things. To, to two men who, who are not used to being seen. They're blind. They listen. Look what Jesus does to them. He touches their eyes. He wants them to know he is right there and he sees them. He touches them. And said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. Because you believe. Let's see what happens. And then in 30 it says, and their sight was restored. But Jesus warned them sternly. See that no one knows about this. Now, I have to tell you, this is hard for me. If Jesus has done something mighty in your life, can you keep it quiet? If you're healed. If, if I was blind and now I see. If I was the woman and I, I have been 12 years been suffering in a, an impossible situation, could I keep it quiet when I'm healed? I don't know how. I, I'm not good about keeping... It's, how could you not share what God's done in you with you, what Jesus has done for you in his life? But he did share. And, and you'll read in Luke and Mark how, how they shared and how the crowds kept getting bigger and bigger. But we're not done yet. There's one more impossible situation coming right here, and it's right now. And when but they went out and spread the news about him all over that region. Now, look what happens in 32. While they were going out, there's almost a line at the door. Can't you feel this thing? There's just this line, and Jesus is saying, I just want to rest for a minute. A man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. Now, we need to look at that a little bit. It's easy to read over this. Now, what this, at this time, it, 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 you, it was believed a person could drive out a demon if you knew the name of the demon. Do you remember when Jesus talked to the man uh, where the, the demons went to the pigs, he asked Jesus, you know, what's your name? I mean, pardon me. Jesus asked the man, uh, the, 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 the evil spirits, what's your name? And they, the guy goes, um, our name is Legion. But in this particular case, <clears throat> did you catch the fact this man was mute? He could not speak. This was an impossible situation because there's no way anybody could get the name of the demon out of him. It's totally impossible. Nobody could do anything to help him. Somebody brought him to Jesus. There's no indication this man has any faith. There's no indication that he was just brought. Let's see what happens. And when the demon was driven out, we don't know how. Did Jesus just say the word? Did he speak? Did he touch it? We don't know. All we know is Jesus said, 
probably just said, leave, and, and he was cleaned out. And the man who had been mute spoke. When Jesus changes a heart, when he cleans a man or a woman's mind and body and restores them to health, how can they not but speak? The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. Now going on with this, but the Pharisees said it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. If Matthew is putting this in, this, these four stories, this, this, these, this maybe two or three hour block of time, why did he put it here? Why did he put it right after he, J- Jesus was teaching about this new thing? This new thing I'm doing. Well, I think it's because, and I've really been wrestling with this, I think it's because, not just because four people were, were healed and, and risen from the dead, we've already seen all that happen, except for the rising of the dead. That's new, I get. I think it's because who the people were. These are people that normally wouldn't receive any help from anybody, hardly. They were not seen of any value. A little girl, a, a, ble- a woman who is bleeding, um, Blind men, a demon-possessed man, nobody would help them at all. They are outside of God's help. This was impossible. Now think about it. What is this new thing that God's doing through Jesus? What is he saying? I'm new wine. I will listen to everyone and anyone. No one is outside of my sight. Anyone who seeks me will find me. Do you realize what a radical word this is here for us? But their faith isn't very good. Their faith is not is cockeyed. Yeah, it is. God still heard them. Jesus listened. We have a king who sees each of us. I'm imperfect. My faith isn't very good. I know that. I'm a sinner. I haven't, I haven't talked to him in years. Call out to him. He'll hear you. He's not just with you. He wants to guide you, lead you like a shepherd. Remember Psalm 23? He's waiting for you to call out to Him, and He'll show you what you can do. I think this passage also shows you can always call out to Him, even in the midst of an impossible situation. And most importantly to me, and, and this is the hardest thing I've had to learn over the years. Let me go back to my story. I've thought a lot about what God did. I mean, honestly, it was. It was one of the hardest days, mornings of my life when the, the, the band broke down. I know it may, for many of you it's not a big deal, but it was for me. What did he teach me through this? And I don't know if I so much thought about it at the time. I've been thinking about it in this context this week. But I was reminded again, he's saying, look, I hear you. I see you. He's not up there. He is here with me. And I can trust him to lead me or to do what needs to be done, even in the midst of impossible situations. Did I pray that morning that our van would break down in such a way that a nice guy would help us and we end up going shopping for Julie and the kids that morning? I guarantee you I did not pray that. I guarantee it. (laughs) But God in his mercy not only took care of the car, took care of things that we did need and made it so we could even afford them. But why? The key thing to these four passages, how do we deal with the impossible situation? Let me give you the, if there's one thing you hear from me today, hear this. This one thing, I want you to really listen. You have a God who loves you. Who wants the best for you. But Jeff, how, I can tell you, I can tell you honestly before the Lord, when that car, my van broke down, I'm saying, Lord, how can you do this to me? I thought you loved me. How would you let me have this car break down? You know how tired we are. I've got a long way to drive. I've got to get stuff done. 
for the church. I, can already, I, I remember thinking those things. And you know what the Lord said to me this week as I was kind of reflecting back on that? He says, I love you. Are you willing to trust me? Even in the hard stuff. You mean, the, whether I realized or not, I had developed a theology that I'm blessed if everything's okay and I'm healthy and everything's just fine. That's not biblical. And the Lord started teaching me. In the midst of the difficulty, in the midst of the impossible, every single person is worth his time. And he's reaching out to them. And he, he wants them to know, I, I, I will work with you, whatever it is. Because he loves each of you and me that much, his mercy extends to each of us. And when you start, if you really grab hold of that, no matter what you're facing right now, and I know we got people right here, people watching, you're facing tough stuff. But I want you to know something. You have a God who loves you. He proved it by what Jesus did on the cross for us. But more than that, he proved it by the fact he sent his presence, the Holy Spirit, to be with us. So constantly he said, I will be with you. I will give you what you need, whatever you're facing. I'm not going to just, you're not going to be healed all the time. Sometimes you're going to have to go through this stuff, and I'm going to show you how. Because I will make it possible. Do you trust him that much? That's the new thing that I think he's teaching. That Matthew wants to make sure we see as readers, as we understand who this Jesus is, this is what Jesus gives us. With his touch, our lives are different. Whatever it is you're facing, he said, you're worth it to him. I will touch you. I will help you. I'll bring you to where I want you to be if you trust me. If you go to that last slide, take a look at Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest, wholeness, peace. What an incredible gift. A new gift he wants to give all those that want to follow him. 